So I'm excited about our new series. I'll be teaching through First and Second Thessalonians, and it will give us a clear, in, a clear look into what is most important in life. It's going to give us a picture of what matters most. It also gives us a clear understanding of the church. Then as we zoom in to an understanding of the church as seen in the New Testament, as we will read through in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, as we zoom into the church, then we will see ourselves as Christians. Then we will see ourselves for who, for who we are. Because the book of First and Thess Second Thessalonians asks real life questions, and these are the questions we're going to be asking ourselves in the sense of viewing it through the church. What in life really, what 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 in life matters most to you? These are real life questions that we're going to look at. What is your greatest purpose in this life? What gets your best time and effort? What gets your best time and effort? What will you regret later because it was not a priority with your time, your talents, and your treasure? You see, First and Second Thessalonians is one of the few books in the New Testament that talks very specifically about the end times. Paul is telling the church there's going to come a time where God is going to come back. There's going to come a time where this earth will cease to exist. That time is coming. Life is short people in Thessalonians. Life is short, but eternity is not. So we're going to speak about that and look into it. We're going to look and see what Paul says about the church, again, us as Christians, and really begin to, as we dive into the scriptures, as we dive into the book, hopefully begin to see ourselves in them, and then we can begin to see ourselves, of course, more clearly. Now, any study of First and Second Thessalonians, you have to have a background of the church in the city of Thessalonica. You have to understand the church, understand kind of how it got started. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they would go on these missionary journeys. They would go into these cities. They begin to, to preach and to teach about who is Jesus. They would preach and teach about the gospel and how lives can be changed through Christ, how there is an end that is coming, but you can prepare and live this life that, with purpose, looking forward to the end. And if we understand this, then we can have a better understanding of this letter to the church in Thessalonica, to the Thessalonians, the Christians there. So Paul and Timothy, they come in about A.D. 50. They're, they're starting the church. They're beginning to talk to people. They're explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer. This was Jesus. They were proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. And all of a sudden, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 1 and following, that God-fearing Greeks, people who were Greeks, began to believe the message. They began to move towards Christ. It even says here the number of leading women. And this, again, begins to show the difference of Christianity in the ancient world, which was inclusive of women gave women leadership roles, began to help them undersee, to see who Christ was for all of humanity. But, verse 5, verse 5 of Acts chapter 17, but the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, and they formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They started a riot with a mob in the city, because the church was expanding and growing, and people were talking about that Jesus is the Messiah, attacking Jason's house, one of the leaders. They searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. They're looking for Paul. They're looking for Silas. Look for Timothy. Verse 6, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers, the Christians, before the city officials, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Would it be said of team church? at the end of maybe this book study, that when you think about this community, that people talk about this church continues to turn the world upside down. These men have turned the world upside down and have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them. They are acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, Jesus. There's another king. And so you understand what's happening here. Paul and Silas, they're, they're starting these churches. The churches are beginning to grow. The Jewish people didn't like it 
because it went against what they believed. They did not see Jesus as the Messiah. They formed a mob. They went and got some wicked men and got a mob to begin to chase Paul and Silas and Timothy out of Thessalonica. They're going to chase them out. As a matter of fact, if you keep reading in Acts, they chased them all the way to Athens. They are not happy about this gospel. They're not happy about how it's changing the world. They do not like what's happening. And so there was an attack on the Christians. I had someone ask me just yesterday. They said, how come it seems like now in our American culture, why the attack on Christians? Like why the attack from, from media in the news athletes, stars, why this attack on the Bible? Why this attack on Christians? Have you asked yourself that? Have you kind of begin to see that? Maybe you're a little bit older like I am, and you're like, things are definitely changing. People are attacking not just the values, but now beginning to name the name, those Christians. And so this person asked me, why is that happening? You know why? Because living for Jesus, Paul saw it here in Thessalonica too. Living for Jesus, speaking about Jesus, telling how Jesus' teachings go and against other teachings in the culture, many times will lead people to be angry enough to riot. And so now we step back, those of us maybe scrolling on our phones, we see the news, we see the things happening, and again, if we're older, we're like, this didn't used to be that way, at least here in America, in our current times, and you would be right. But it's not new in the world. When you read through the New Testament, you read these types of passages. When you speak truth, when you speak Jesus is the only way, when you speak what Jesus actually teaches, a biblical teaching, a biblical te uh, uh, Jesus, then all of a sudden, absolutely people who don't want to hear it, that it goes against what they say. Same thing here. They begin to riot. They begin to oppose it. And it is in this context that the church in Thessalonica is born. It is in this context of fighting for truth, of living out the truth, of being told they're weird, saying they've gone against some of their uh, Jewish heritage if they were Jews. If they were the Greeks who were coming to Christ, they're going against everything those people believed in. They had billions of gods, right? I mean, totally different what was happening. So when we get to the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul's been run out. The church has been started. It has had a great start. And even in the midst of persecutions, even in the midst of teaching things that go against the culture, this church continues to turn the world upside down. This church, these Christians, they understand what matters. And it drives them. They understand what's the greatest purpose in life. And they begin to, and the church has now uh, begun to blossom. And so when we read 1 Thessalonians, and as we're going to read all, all the chapters all the way through 2 Thessalonians, it's Paul's letters. Many believe this was one of the, his first letters that he wrote. So he's been there, started the church. He had to leave, but he's hearing word. He's hearing testimonies about what has been happening. And now he's writing back because they have some questions. And he's going to write back. And remember, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And when Paul is writing these, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. They have been preserved as God's very words, as God's truth. So you and I get to read. Remember, it's not a got to. I get to read my Bible. It is so cool now. You can have it on your phone. You can pick different translations. But friends, we got to start reading the Bible. So I want to encourage you. We're going to teach through First and Second Thessalonians. Why don't you start reading through? How about you and your kids at night? Begin reading through the Bible, reading through First and Second Thessalonians. See what's coming. Maybe write down some questions. I can't cover everything, but maybe I'll answer some questions. And together... We will see what Paul has to say. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanius, that's Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians. To the church. The one, the last time I was there, I got right out of town. The last time I was there, I saw riots and persecution. Yeah, to that church. To the church in Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace 
to you and peace. And I want us to understand here too that Paul is writing to this group of Christians who gather as the church on a weekly basis and then they scatter as the church into the community. They are living their life and he's talking to this group of people to help them understand. And so sometimes when we think of, well, it's just a church universal. It's the church. There's absolutely truth to that, but it helps you to put yourself in the context when you begin to see he's writing to those people that the last time they saw Paul, he was escaping at night. There was a time after Paul left, they drugged Jason and the other leaders, and they're being thrown into prison. They're losing their businesses, and yet the church is flourishing. As you're going to see here, it's growing they're telling everybody, and it doesn't matter what cost them. So sometimes when we're reading through Galatians, Philippians, Ephesians, and we think, oh, to the church, oh, the church. Well, of course, the principles are to the church, but I want us to go into the context. I want us to go into First and Second Thessalonians. I want to go into Thessalonica because it's in Thessalonica that if you understand what Paul is saying, then you can then let it impact your life in our context. Grace to you and peace, verse 2. We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to remember that phrase, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The first thing he's going to say to these people is about hope, love, and faith. But I bet you, you're going to see something different than maybe you think you see when you read through that. Verse 4, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel did not come to you in word only. Oh, no, it also came in power in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit. You saw us. I want you to imitate what we were doing. You saw what was happening. And you yourselves became imitators of us and the Lord when in spite of severe persecution... You welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result, you became examples to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And, the, and for the word of the Lord rang out from you. For the word of the Lord rang out from you. And not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Notice this, rang out, goes out. Therefore, we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you. How you, this is incredible, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. When he's given examples, when he's congratulating them, he only goes, and he goes first, I should say, to this idea of turning from idols, remember that, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Uh, again, sometimes we just blow through that. You're being persecuted in Thessalonica. Man, the church is growing. People are talking about the conversion rate. People are talking about how the Greeks are flocking into your churches. People are talking about Jews are coming, women are coming. It's incredible. Even in the midst of persecution, keep moving. Keep doing what really, really matters. Because Jesus was what matters. You living for him is what matters. And he has come. And he ends the chapter not by saying, to give you your best life now. To make you really happy. To make things really cool. He doesn't do that. Jesus has come to save you from the wrath. End times. The wrath of what is coming. The church and its purpose matter. That's the beginning of 1 Thessalonians. Your church, you as Christians, what you do, what you believe, it matters. See, we've developed a wrong picture 
and the, of the church and therefore the wrong purpose of the church. We have a wrong picture of church. We really don't understand what church is for. Hence, we've separated ourselves and our individual lives from the greatest purpose in our life. We have turned church into something that it's really not. And again, in our culture, I told you before, we devalue church. People, but well, I'm the church. I'm the church. I don't have to go. To, you're not the church. You're a Christian. And the church gathers so that it can scatter. But even in that, we have lost a clear picture, that purpose of our Christian lives, which is the greatest purpose in all of our life. And so when we separate ourselves from the church and we see it for what it's not, then all of a sudden it's no wonder we have Christians who are scrolling through their phone, running around the country, idolizing their kids, trying to find something that gives them purpose, something that fulfills them from within. But as a follower of Christ, we're going to see, we're going to see exactly for the Christians in Thessalonica. And they lived in a large city, over 200,000 people, a metropolitan city. This isn't some, some little tribe. It's a city with commerce and buildings and homes, schools. It's going up. It's a different, it's the same type of atmosphere. We've separated ourselves from the connection of the church. Again, the church gathers for a purpose, and then it goes out for the mission. It's, Paul says it, it, it's gone out. It's rang out. So definitely, church gathers. Christians, we gather. And when, we are the, when we're gathered, we are the church. And then we scatter. It's rang out. The gospel goes out. But one of the pictures that I've heard so many times that we have to change, I'm going to spend some time doing it today, is what is church? Some people say, man, the church... It's a hospital. No, actually, it's not. No, no, no. Jesus said it's not the sick who need a hospital. I mean, it's not the well who need a hospital. It's the sick. Sure, the church has elements of like a hospital. Everyone is welcome when your lives are sick. But guess what? You know how many times I've been to the hospital this year? None. I, I took my dumb son who cut his forehead shooting a rifle to urgent care. I didn't go to the hospital. But I personally haven't been to the hospital. So if the church is a hospital, watch this. Oh, the church is a hospital. Well, then when my life is bad, I better go to church. When my family is crumbling, I better go to church. When I need something, I'm sick, there's a problem, I will go to church because church is a hospital. Church is not a hospital. It functions, absolutely, as Jesus said. It's those who are sick who need it, absolutely. But if you just see it as a place, the only time I go is when I'm hurting, when my wife left me, when I lost my job, when I, when I don't know what to do, then all of a sudden we have a wrong picture of the church. It's not a hospital. I hope for you, you don't have to go to the hospital the rest of the year. I don't hope that for you when it comes to coming to church. Does that make sense? Church is not a school in a sense of this is where we come and get education. This is where we come and learn. Do you learn at church? I hope so. But it's not just a, oh, okay, gather everybody up. Let's go learn something. Got to go learn about Jesus. It's a place where you do learn, but you can't see it as a school. Why? Well, when I went to school... I never walked in and fist bumped the teachers like, hey, I'm here to help you teach. I'm here. You're going to teach. I'm going to teach. You take your turns. When we go to school, we go and we sit and we listen. Now, you're doing that right now. But that's, it's not just a school. It's not just a positive community place that we go when we have kids. And this is going to sting for a little, for some of us. We've been doing this. We'll celebrate 25 years. I know I don't look that old. I started, started the church when I was 15. <laughs> we'll celebrate 25 years in January. And over the years, we've seen people come to church. This is a great place to raise our kids, and it's good and moral and social. It's awesome. And then when their kids graduate and leave, we don't see the parents anymore. 
wrong view of the church. Should you come here for social gatherings and see things and learn things and learn to grow and do life together? Absolutely. It's in our mission statement. I think you see what I'm saying. We have to have a clear picture. Church does all those things, but it's the thing that we are, in, we are a part of. It is what we also do. And I'll say one last thing because I saw some people doing this. Church is not a place like the, 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 the drug fix on the corner. I come here and get my worship on and get motivated and so I can live the rest of the day like, like you're coming for a fix. Not that either. I hope that you are motivated. I hope you're inspired. I hope that it, it helps you throughout your day. But you don't, uh, you don't come here just to, again, get something. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's about what we're doing together. It is the church. The New Testament demands we get a better and more biblical view of the church. Watch this. And then it'll get us a better view of ourselves. It'll get us a better view of what does it mean to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And you're like, Kenny, how does any of that answer the purpose of my life question? I want things that matter. I'm, I'm that person scrolling. How does that? I'm telling you, hang with me. Hang with Paul, I should say. And you're going to see by the time we finish today, you're going to see how it all comes together. If you have a clear picture of the church... If you have a clear picture because of the church of who you are in Christ as a follower of Christ, then you begin to see what they discovered about their life. I think sometimes, I think sometimes the people we read about the Bible, if they knew that we had a whole culture of Christians running around trying to find their purpose, trying to figure out what matters in life, I think they'd be a little bit like, I don't think they're reading the Bible. I don't think that was a challenge, at least for the people I'm reading here, the Christians in Thessalonica. So we have this New Testament demands this better picture of ourselves, of the church. And when we read these, I'm going to read these verses again, read these verses through the lens of a fully devoted follower of Christ who has found life purpose through the gospel and living out through the church. I'm going to reread these, these first two verses. And then we're going to talk about it for the rest of today's message so that you can see that maybe what you read, if you're just blowing through it, you miss the part that we need to get today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 again. Paul says, we always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. Who is he talking about? The church, the people in the church, Okay. We recall in the presence of God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, love, and hope. How many times have I heard that? The Christian faith, the pillars to the Christian church is hope and faith and love, and you can go any order, love and faith and hope. And if we just had love and faith and hope, it would be an incredible thing, and our church would be solid and faith and love. Do you know what he's actually saying? What is the context? What is the result of each? The Christians at Thessalonica had discovered what mattered most. They discovered what mattered most. In the midst of doing their daily life, 200,000, city, big city, in the midst of doing their daily life work, they had to get up and grind just like you. They had to work. In the midst of raising a family and having kids and being married, in the midst of sports, you're like, can he come on? He was reaching the Greeks right outside of Athens. Where did the Olympics start? These people did sports. They weren't huddled like in a teepee just around a fire. They lived their life. These are metropolitan people. They were enjoying life sacrificing, watching people pass. They were doing life. And in the midst of that, they discovered when Paul and Ty, uh, Timothy and Silas came through, they discovered everything they ever wanted when they discovered and they heard about the Messiah who had come, Jesus who had come. And now they no longer feared the end times. They looked forward to it because they knew time was short, but eternity is long and that inspired them that changed 
their heart and they begin to understand what really mattered. They received the truth of the gospel, the true life in Christ. They got the gospel and their heart shifted. If you're a Christian today, I want you to take your heart's passion, the purpose, and match it to what Paul says here that he saw in their life. Now we're going to break it down. And maybe you'll see something a little bit different than faith, love, and hope. Desire to work comes from what you really believe in. What did Paul say? He said, we recall in the presence of God our Father, your work produced by faith. What you really believe in gets you up and going in the morning. What you really believe in is this work. And you're like, what well, does that work really mean like work? Yes, I'm familiar with Greek. Yes, it's work. It's the same word for like, I got up and go to work. I'm going to work. It's work. And so Paul says, as Christians, they were working, sharing their faith, working. It inspired them. Their desire to work comes from, um, the desire from work comes from what you really believe in, which is what? Your faith. Faith. When I have faith, it produces what I do as far as getting up and working. The word here, faith, is work. I mean, faith is conviction of the truth. What are you convicted of? What are you, what, what are you convicted? Man, I know that's true. Do you have anything? Now, again, in our world that doesn't believe in absolute truth, you can just believe whatever. This is part of the problem. But for a Christian, you don't have that option. When you put your faith in Christ, now your faith says, I am convicted. That, I mean, I have a conviction of truth that Jesus is the only way. And what he says matters. Because I have faith in Jesus and his gospel, I work. I'm a part of. You see, my faith in Jesus being a Christian means I don't see the church as something that is done for me. I don't see it as a school. I don't see it as a hospital. I'm not getting a quick fix. I'm a part of. I'm working. I'm serving. I'm using my gifts. This thing matters to me. It matters that we share the gospel. And so we don't be, that the church is not something that's done for me. It's not what is for me and how I can be helped. I'm not a spectator. I come here when the saints gather and we have church. And then we leave and we scatter. The church goes into the community. Church goes into every aspect of your life. And it changes how you see everything. Fulfillment and purpose comes from who I am and then what I do about it. I don't have a purpose, my fulfillment. When you know who you are, and then you begin to work from who you are, you don't wake up wondering what your purpose is. You don't want to wake up. You don't wake up wondering what really matters in life. There are other things that matter. We can have multiple purposes, but you, talk, you know what I'm talking about. That main purpose, that main, this is what matters. Paul said, your work produced by faith. We focus on the faith part, which is good, but the faith produced something, work. I'm a part of something that's turning the world upside down. I'm a part of something that's changing lives. But he goes on, willingness to experience labor is motivated by what I truly care about. I told you we we're going to get there. What do you care about? Paul calls that love. It's agape. What's the word for agape there? Love. Willingness to experience labor is motivated by what you truly care about. People say, like, man, we just got to have love. You just got to love Jesus. You just got to have love for God. Absolutely. And what does Paul say when you love, love like that? <laughs> he says you're willing to have labor. You know what the word labor means there? A striking, a beating, to cut, toil result, resulting in weariness, laborious toil, trouble. Those of you who've had babies, what's the ultimate sign of love? It's, give, it's, a, it's giving birth to your kid, right? And then there was labor, same principle. Because of love, I'm willing to 
Now, I've never experienced it. Labor, pain. But because of love, this is what Paul is talking here. And Paul is saying, your willingness to be beaten and put into trouble is motivated by love. Your labor motivated by love. Again, we look at love. Oh, love. If you love the Lord, he's like, you people love the Lord. You love God with everything. It matters to you. And so you're okay with the labor, the beatings, the persecutions, the difficulty in life. We've become so, uh, again, just a bad teaching. This agape love, when you understand what matters most, you're okay. You didn't like it, but you have the willingness to live for what truly matters, what truly has the greatest purpose in your life. This is what he's talking about. When he's looking back to the Christians in Thessalonica, he says, wow. You love Jesus. Wow, it's incredible. People are talking about it. It's ringing out everywhere. You love Jesus. And what was his sign of love? It's so different than today. We're even when they talk about churches and Christians, <laughs> he's like, I know you love because it produced labor. You're willing, you're okay with the pain that comes with it. You're okay. Have you ever seen the movie? If you haven't, you should. Braveheart with Mel Gibson. Braveheart is a story of, of William Wallace. And Scotland has been invaded by England, and he's going to, to fight. If you fast forward to the, to the end of the movie, William Wallace has been fighting. People are following him. People are dying, but they have a cause. They love their land. They love their freedom. And there's a scene in the movie where Robert the Bruce, who's a, also a Scot, but he's, a, he's an estate owner. He, he's rich. And so even if England comes in, if he makes some deals with England, Scotland will be taken over and you peasants won't have freedom, but he would still have his lands. And so the group in England's made a deal with Robert the Bruce, who owns land. He betrays William Wallace. And in a scene, he's talking to his dad, or Bruce is talking to his dad, and he's like, hey, you, his dad's like, you did the right thing, you saved your family's land. And there's this incredible scene where he's telling his dad, he said, I saw William Wallace and I betrayed him on the battlefield. People follow me because if they don't follow me, I'll put them in prison I'll take away their lands. They follow him because he has something I don't have. He has something to believe in. And that's the phrase. And he tells his dad, I want to believe like William Wallace. I want to love Scotland and freedom like William Wallace. And he says, I betrayed him, and I saw it in his eyes. The betrayal. It's an incredible story. It's a true story. That's what Paul's talking about. He, oh, we Christians, we just love. There's all kinds of aspects, but don't forget a big part of love. The only one he brings up here is your willingness to do whatever it takes because you have discovered the great pearl, Jesus called it. You've discovered what matters most. That's the problem with most Christians. We don't know what matters most. We scroll on our phones. We run around the country. We do all kinds of things because at the end of the day, we're Christians, but we don't know in our hearts we don't love Jesus the way William Wallace loved Scotland. And Robert the Bruce says, I want to believe. You see, that's us. That's your kids. Why is everybody leaving the church once they get high? Because we never gave them anything of value to believe in. That's why. That's why, friends. What do you believe in? What you believe, I've been saying this for weeks, really matters. What do you believe in? But then he goes to the last part. The ability to have endurance through difficulty is produced by what matters most to you. What does Paul call it? Hope. Now, some of you are going, okay, I think you're, that's what it says. 
and your endurance inspired by hope, your work produced by faith, labor motivated. See, all of a sudden now faith, hope, and love takes on a little bit of a difference, doesn't it? Because this isn't some walk through Disney World tulip deal. He's like, man, you've been radically saved. Your life has been changed. And because you have hope, what? Hope in the end times. Hope in eternity. Hope that God's with you. Because you have hope, you're, you're, you have an, uh, the ability to endure. The word endure there is to bring, bearing up under a heavy load. <laughs> So we want to be like the church in Thessalonica. Really? They're changing the world. It's an incredible deal. They're not roaming around looking for purpose and what matters in life. We want to be like them. Okay. Well, Paul says, let's not do the hope, love, and, jo uh, hope, love, and faith deal. Paul says, work, labor, and endure. That probably doesn't sell a lot of books. No one's going to invite me to be a motivational speaker. How do I find my purpose in life? Work, labor, endure. How do I know what matters and really I won't spend my whole life trying to figure out what really matters? Labor, work, and endure. No, no, no. We want to do hope, love, and faith, which is true, but you got to have both. And maybe if you're not okay with these, maybe if you run like a, 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 a I won't say, you just run, from these, maybe the love, hope, and faith is not as big a deal as you think it is. And so we have to understand what Paul is saying here. I believe many Christians are scrolling in their phone, seeking purpose, even though they're Christians, because they've given their life to a faulty version of church. They've given their life to a faulty version of the gospel, and they've given their life and not understanding, not saying they're not Christians, they're not understanding. We want God to love us with agape, unconditional love, and he does. And then when we love him that way, now the purpose question, what matters in life, begins to fade away. Paul ends this first chapter. Again, we understand the church and his purpose matter. But of all the things he could have said, kind of like the proof, right? We're going to end with this. Kind of the proof of the love, faith, and hope. He ends the chapter. He's writing this letter. What does he say? You turn from idols. You turn from idols. He's sticking with the heart, friends. He's sticking with the heart. You see, as Christians, we spend all our time trying to fit in. Trying, we spend all of our time trying to be accepted. The Christians in Thessalonica were weird. Listen to this. If you have a phone, take a picture of this, post it. No one will like it. Christians should look weird in a culture that is worldly. And you know what I mean by worldly, right? Other than Christ, other than biblical teachings, other than those morals. You should look weird. But we've spent way too much time, late 80s, 90s, we spent way too much time trying to fit in where we need to be accepted and look like everybody else. You need to look like Jesus. I need to look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, watch movies that Jesus would watch, read books that Jesus would read. That's what I need to do. And does that look weird? Absolutely. And Paul says to them, you're changing the world. This is incredible what you're doing. And your love and your faith and your hope is producing work and labor. You're willing to labor, be persecuted. You're willing to endure. And you do it with hope and love and faith, which means they didn't like it all the time, but they understood what it, was, what it, what it meant. We spend all of our time trying to fit in, be accepted. And Jesus and Paul says, be like Christ, and then people will be, you'll be an example for them. You'll be the model for them. He said, you've turned from idols. You've turned from idols. Listen, I think that is one of the biggest reasons 
why many Christians don't know their purpose, don't have a sense of that what really matters is because their heart really has love and hope and faith in something else, whatever that idol is for you. Look at this things on the, on the screen here. We can choose who our God will be, but we cannot choose to have no God. We can choose what we're going to worship, who's going to be our master, who's going to be our Lord. We can choose that. But we cannot choose to have no God. Everybody has something that masters them, something that they love, something that they put their hope in. We can choose who or what we will worship, but we cannot choose to worship nothing. We all worship something. Like, I don't even like music. I don't like words. The first time I've been, I don't worship. We all give homage. We worship something. You can choose what you will worship, but you're going to worship something. Why? We are creation. Longing to worship our creator. That's how we were made. But when we have false idols, we worship other things. We can choose a highest priority, but we cannot choose to prioritize nothing. You have priorities. You do. Some of you are like, well, I don't have any priorities. That's a problem if you think that. <laughs> but you do have priorities where you put your time, your talents, your resources, your, your thought pattern. That's what you really prioritize. Paul was saying to them, prioritize, you are prioritizing the gospel, and that has changed everything. You are prioritizing, you are worshiping the living God, and that has changed everything. You had the choice, and you turned from idols. Amen. You turned from idols. So, as I close, what matters most to you? Because that's going to be where you're motivated. Let's pray.